Tonight we're beginning a four-part study titled Learning How to Study the Bible. I'd like to begin this study with a pop quiz. And so here's the question. Which of these phrases are not found in the Bible? Number one, cleanliness is next to godliness. Number two, God helps those who help themselves. Number three, confession is good for the soul. Number four, money is the root of all evil. And number five, honesty is the best policy. Which of these phrases are not found in the Bible? I'll give you a hint. It would be none of the above. None of these phrases are actually found in God's word. And not only are none of these phrases found in the Bible, but listen, three of them are complete heresy. Three of them are in complete contradiction with the teaching of God's word. It was in his book, Growing True Disciples, where George Barna revealed this trend in biblical illiteracy when he revealed that the most widely known Bible verse among adult and teen believers is this. God helps those who help themselves. When asked what their favorite verse in the Bible is, they repeated this phrase, God helps those who help themselves. And, and it's sad to say that this concept, God helps those who help themselves, this phrase is not only not found in the Bible, but it, but it actually teaches something that is in conflict with the overriding basic message of the Bible. As a matter of fact, the Bible actually teaches us that God helps those who trust in him. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God helps those who help themselves, but rather the Bible tells us that God helps those who trust in him. God helps those who receive by faith his grace. Those who trust in Jesus Christ and those who enter into the throne room of grace to, to seek mercy and help in time of need, these are the people who receive help from God, not those who help themselves. Listen, after we receive the free gift of God's grace, the Christian can rest in the fact that the work of salvation was finished on the cross. Therefore, God helps those who trust in him. Rather than straining under the burden of sin, trying to help ourselves to heaven, rather than trying with all of our might to work our way into heaven, the Christian can simply rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. God isn't interested in us attempting to help ourselves. He's interested in us trusting in him and trusting what his word says. Paul even confirms this fact when he tells us that God has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God raises us up together. He's the one who makes us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is God's work, not ours. And listen, according to Paul here, we're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And while I can't explain what that means, uh, all I know is that in some sort of spiritual, supernatural way, Paul already sees us as being seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Now, with this concept in mind, let's imagine for a moment that uh, the Lord has given us a spiritual chair to, to sit upon. You know, if we're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, then imagine that he has a stool for us to, to sit upon. And, and imagine now that this stool that we're seated upon actually is a three-legged stool. Each leg of this spiritual stool is absolutely necessary for providing us the rest that we can experience in Christ. As we consider these three legs, I'd like to point out that the first leg of this stool well, it would be the leg of worship. And so there's rest in Christ as we worship God. As we spend time worshiping him, we find ourselves at rest as we sit upon this three-legged stool. The psalmist even spoke of this rest in Psalms chapter 95 when he declared, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. When we bow down and kneel before the Lord, and worship him, we experience rest in Christ. 
The second leg of this stool is the leg of prayer. And, and so there's rest in Christ when we spend time praying. The Apostle Paul spoke of the rest that comes from our time in prayer. In Philippians chapter 4, he, he said this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so we see that there's rest in Christ as we spend time praying. The third leg of this spiritual stool, it's the leg of Bible study. And so there's rest in Christ as we spend time studying his word. In Romans 10, the Apostle Paul referred to the rest that we receive when we study the word by declaring this. He said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The faith that we need to continue to rest in Christ, well, that faith comes by hearing and hearing well, that comes when we spend time studying God's word. Now, as we consider these three legs of our spiritual stool, it's sad to say that most Christians are actually missing a leg. Most of us are sitting on a two-legged stool. The reason I say this is based on the fact that uh, while most Christians gladly spend time in prayer and, and most Christians love singing worship songs, there's too many Christians that, that are too quick to admit that they don't read the Bible with any regularity. According to a 2006 Barna Research poll, only 47% of those polled read the Bible in a given week. 47% of those polled read the Bible in a given week. And of that 47%, I wonder how many of those actually read the Bible every day. I wonder how, 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 how many of those would, would simply fall off and, and, and have to admit, yeah, I, I don't read the Bible every day. Is it any wonder why so few Christians are actually enjoying the rest that we have in Christ Jesus? So few Christians actually enjoy the spiritual rest that comes when we sit upon the spiritual stool that the Lord has given to us. You see, you can't rest when you're sitting up on a stool that only has two legs. A two-legged stool is not gonna provide you with any rest. We need all three legs of that stool in order to support our weight and give us the rest we need. Therefore, we need to spend time in prayer. And we need to spend time worshiping and we need to spend time studying God's word. With this in mind, I want to consider the words of Paul who declared this in Hebrews chapter four. He says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Christian, listen, if you want to enjoy the rest that comes from being seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, then you must spend time praying and worshiping and studying his word. We need to spend time studying his word because the word of God is what's, is what's living and powerful in our lives. If you're lacking power, if you're, if you're lacking the, the spiritual energy that you need to, to live for the Lord, well, it's because you're not resting in him and you're not receiving the power of his word. Now, I'm certain that if I were to take an informal poll here tonight and say, hey, who, who thinks that studying the Bible is important? I'm sure every hand would go up. Yeah, we all believe that studying the Bible is important. I think the average Christian understands the importance of spending time reading the Bible. However, the problem arises as we approach this one book, which is actually made up of 66 books. We look at 66 books. And, oh, man, that's, that's huge. And these 66 books contain 1,189 chapters. And those chapters include over 31,000 verses. 31,000 verses. Oh, man. 
That's a lot of information. And, and these 31,000 verses are filled with idioms, axioms, parables, metaphors, analogies, allegories, and cultural practices that most of us are completely clueless about. As we take into, consider, into consideration all of these details, the simple task of reading the Bible can quickly become an overwhelming burden for us. And if you find yourself struggling to interpret the meaning of the passages that you're reading, then this study is designed to help you to learn how to get the most out of your, out of your Bible study time. What this is our goal, I want to begin by talking here about the importance of interpretation. And and we'll talk about interpretation throughout this entire series. But when it comes to processing the information that we read, when it comes to uh, understanding the text and, and, and interpreting what it means and applying it to our lives, there's actually two approaches that we can take. The first is what we call eisegesis. Eisegesis occurs when the reader reads into the text their own opinion. They approach the scriptures, they already have an opinion about things, and then when they read the text, they take their opinion and place it onto the text and they force that opinion onto the text. This is eisegesis. Rather than seeking to understand the author's original intent, the reader who engages in eisegesis will simply force their own point of view onto the text, which then skews their interpretation of the text. This approach is completely subjective to the reader, to their opinions, and to their own ideas. And it oftentimes results in heretical doctrines and even sinful practices. If you'd like to see this method of interpretation put into practice, then just go home after church this evening and turn on the Big Hair Network or what some people call TBN. Just turn on TBN for a few hours and you'll see, you know, nine out of 10 preachers on TBN applying eisegesis to the text. They take a verse, they take it out of its context, and they begin to force their opinions onto the text. It's not a good approach. Not good at all. Well, the second approach to biblical interpretation is called exegesis. And exegesis is the interpretation and understanding of a text on the basis of the text itself. Just imagine the word exegesis coming from the word exit. And the idea is that you're attempting to exit from the text what it means. The person who attempts to interpret and understand the plain meaning of the verse by defining the words and by examining the surrounding context and even uh, considering the historical context that the text finds itself in, this person is engaging in the practice known as exegesis. They're attempting to exit the meaning of the text from the text itself. Without debate, exegesis is always better than the subjective approach of eisegesis. Therefore, uh, we're gonna spend our time over the next uh, you know, four studies learning how to interpret the Bible by applying the exegetical approach to our Bible study time. With this as our goal, the first thing that I want to point out is that the exegetical approach, the one that we need for proper biblical interpretation, it actually provides us with three different scopes which will help us to interpret and understand the Bible. Now, I should point out that a scope is actually an optical device or a tool which is designed to help us to see things by adjusting the magnification of the thing we're looking at. For example, a telescope helps us to study things that are far away. At the same time, a microscope helps us to study the details of something that's very small. And with that being the case, the person who uses a microscope to study the stars, well, they've chosen the wrong scope. You can't use a microscope to study the stars. At the same time, the person who uses a telescope in order to study microorganisms, they too have chosen the wrong scope. Now with this example in mind, we must consider the importance of having the right scope for the time that we spend studying the Bible. But before we approach our study of God's word, the question that we must ask first is this, what is the scope of my study? 
Because if I want to get a broad perspective of a book in the Bible, or if I want to get the broad perspective of the Bible itself, then I need to use the scope that's called the synthetic scope. I'll explain what that is in a moment. At the same time, if I want to analyze the individual ideas given within a book or within a paragraph, then I should use the analytical scope. And finally, if I desire to spend time seeking what God's word would say to me personally, then I would use the devotional scope. With that, I'd like to consider these three Bible study scopes in light of a road trip that Brenda and I recently took to Big Bend, Texas. I'd like to begin by using the synthetic scope. With the synthetic scope in in mind, I'd like to point out that last winter, Brenda and I began to prepare for our trip to Big Ben. But before we left, we spent some time examining the entire trip on Google Maps. I looked at different hotels. I looked at different routes. There was a couple different ways that we could go. And and I wanted to get the most out of the trip, and so I needed to get a a, a broad view of what this trip was going to be like. As we studied the map of our great state of Texas, we were able to clearly define the two best routes from Austin, Texas to Big Bend. And in this way, I had a pretty good understanding uh, of the general trip before we even got in the truck. This is kind of like using the synthetic scope for studying the Bible. You see, the synthetic scope seeks to gain a broad and general understanding of the Bible. It's not a scope that, that sends us into looking at the little minutiae and details and, and you know, defining words and these sorts of things. No, it just says, well, what is this author getting at here? What's the big picture of this individual book? The goal is to gather the basic information necessary for, for understanding the overriding message or, or, or theme or thesis of each book. For example, as we read the book of Romans using the synthetic scope, we discover that the book of Romans is about God's grace being extended to both Jews and Gentiles alike through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and while we can get down into the minutia and into the details of oh, what's Romans 9 and who's it talking to and, and, and what does he mean by this statement right here, and those are questions that we can ask later on when we engage in the analytical scope. But when we use the synthetic scope, we're just trying to get a, a greater understanding of what Paul's trying to say? What, what's the overriding theme here? What, what, what's the big idea of Romans? And it, it's about God's grace. And, and God's grace being extended to both Jews and Gentiles alike. As we read 1 Corinthians using the synthetic scope, we discover that the major theme is the importance of love as the basis for Christian fellowship and service. That's the uh, overarching theme of the book. If you're reading a book using the synthetic scope and you discover a verse that's hard to understand, you just make a note of it and move on. You know, you're using the synthetic scope. You're just trying to get a general feel for the book itself. And and you come across a passage that you don't quite understand. And sometimes Christians say, oh, you know, I don't understand what this means. And so they stop studying the book. Don't do that. Just say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just trying to read through the book right now. I'm just trying to grasp the, the, the greater meaning of this book. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over this part that I don't quite understand. I'll come back to it later. And I'm just going to continue reading the book. Then later on, you can come back and after you've read through the book and, and grasped the greater meaning, then you can take that greater meaning that, that you uh, gathered from using the synthetic scope. Then you can begin to apply the second scope which is the analytical scope. With that, I'd like to take a moment to talk about this second scope, the, the analytical scope. And thinking back to that trip to Big Ben, uh, Big ben that Brendan and I took, we, we began by looking at the map of Texas using the synthetic scope. We wanted to synthesize a bunch of information together so that we could get a general idea of what the trip was going to be like. But then came the day when we loaded up the truck and, and, and we headed out to Big Bend. And as we made our way west... Well, there were many things to analyze along the way, uh, like as soon as lunchtime hit. We needed to figure out where, where we were going to lunch, right? And, and you know, you can kind of look at different people and what they've said about different restaurants on Yelp and stuff like that, you know, but the, the proof is in the pudding for me. And what I mean by that is that if it's lunchtime and the parking lot of that restaurant is empty, chances are 
It's no bueno. It's no good. How do I know that? Because there's nobody there. But when you see a, 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 a restaurant on the side of the highway, you know, and, and, and it's lunchtime and, and the parking lot is jam-packed with cars, you better believe that they're serving some good food in there. And the reason I know that is because I analyze the situation and I see everyone else is eating there, so they must be doing something right. I use the analytical scope. I analyze the situation and we found a good place to eat lunch. When it was time to refuel, I began to look at the price tag of the gas. What was the gallon of gas at this place? And, and what was the gallon of gas at that place? And what's the cost of it? I'm looking for the cheapest gas I can find. We've got to go all the way to Big Bend. And so I would analyze that. That wasn't something that Google Maps could tell me. No, it was in the process of traveling to Big Bend that I began to analyze which gas stations had the cheapest gas. We would pass highway attractions along the way that, that we may or may not explore. We would consider it as we went. We would analyze the, the roadside attraction when we got to it. And if it looked like it was a tourist trap and, and it was going to you know, rob us of, of time and money, then we just kept going. And if it looked fun and it looked like it you know, was something that we would enjoy, then we'd stop and check it out. We're looking at the trip now through the analytical scope. And, and these questions really couldn't be answered by looking through the synthetic scope. A map of Texas can't tell you which restaurants you're gonna like. No, we have to look through the analytical scope as we're on our trip. Likewise, when it comes to Bible study, the synthetic scope can't answer every question about all the little details that you come across as you're reading through a book of the Bible. And for all this, we must use the analytical scope. With the analytical scope, the reader begins to outline the text. We begin to ask, you know, how, how, how would we outline this chapter or how would we outline this book? We begin to observe key words. We begin to look at re repeated warnings or commands. We, we begin to analyze promises and the reasons for those promises. We begin to look at the questions that are being posed by the author. And we begin to look at the contrasts that the author is presenting us between this and that. The reader begins to ask about the background of the author. Who, who's writing? Where are they from? What was their life experience? And what was the world that they were in? We begin, to, we, we, we begin to ask, what is the issue that this author is attempting to deal with? The, re the reader becomes interested in the audience. We want to know about their linguistic idioms and their social idiosyncrasies. The analytical scope helps us to slow down and analyze the details as we read through a text. We want to slow down and analyze every little detail that are easily missed when we're looking at the Bible through the synthetic scope. Now there is much to be learned as we look through the synthetic scope and there's much to be learned as we look through the analytical scope. Both of them are important for our Bible study time. It just, it's important for us to, at the outset of the study time, say, okay, I'm, I'm reading this book with the synthetic scope. I just want to synthesize a bunch, a bunch of information as I make my way through the book or we want to say, okay, this is analytical time. I'm going to actually dig in. I'm going to start defining words. I'm going to start asking tough questions of the text. It's good to just start off saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this is what the time is for. But it's important to understand that all of our Bible studies should bring us to the third scope, which is the devotional scope. In order to understand the aim of the devotional scope, I want to go back to the story of the road trip that Brenda and I took last winter when we went to Big Bend. Remember, we used the synthetic scope as we examined the entire trip. Uh, we looked at that map of Texas, and we looked at the different routes and just synthesized a bunch of information to plan out the trip. And, and then we actually took the trip. We, we, we used the analytical scope as we did. We, we analyzed uh, you know, in the midst of the trip, we, we reassessed our trip along the way, made some changes along the way that, that we didn't, you know, we saw some problems that came up along the way that we couldn't see in the map and made some choices along the way just using the analytical scope. But, but then, listen, the whole point of the trip was to enjoy each other's company. The whole point of the trip was just to enjoy uh, being on vacation with my bride. 
Think about it. We, we could have, you know, looked at the, the whole trip through the synthetic scope and planned out routes and, and, and we could have, you know, employed the analytical scope along the way, but, but we could have done that in two different cars. She could have taken her car, I could have taken my truck, and, and we could have eaten at different restaurants along the way. We could have stayed at different hotel rooms along the way, and you would think I was ridiculous if I did that. The whole point of planning the trip was to spend time together, devotionally devoted to one another. We wanted devotional time with one another as we took this trip, and the whole trip was designed as a way for Brenda and I to spend time together. Likewise, listen, the Bible has been designed as a devotional book. And we can get into the history and we can get the greater theme of the book and we, and, and we can miss out on true devotional time with the Lord Jesus. The synthetic scope is important. The analytical scope is important. But the whole point is to have devoted time with the Lord Jesus. And as we have this devoted time studying God's word, it results in a deeper relationship with the Lord. Now, it'll help you to know that we utilize the devotional scope when we ask these sorts of questions of the text. How does this verse challenge my current way of thinking? How does this verse challenge my current belief system. Here's another question. In what way does this verse challenge me to change my current course of action? How does this verse challenge my lifestyle? You might ask, is there a promise here in this text that I've failed to appropriate for myself? Or is there something here that I need to be seeking counsel for because I'm caught in something that the Bible says is sin? It's sad to say that there's too many people who study the Bible looking for loopholes. That's why they study the Bible. They're looking for loopholes. They're, they're looking for ways to justify what they're doing, though they know what they're doing is wrong. And so it's kind of like when they go find counsel. They, they want to find a counselor who already agrees with them. And so they just continue going for count, from counselor to counselor you know, until they find someone who lines up with what they already thought. And, oh, this is, this is the person that's being led by God right here. Right? In similar fashion, they read the Bible the same way. Looking for anything that will support what they already believe. That's just eisegesis. The person who studies the word of God exegetically and devotionally will be looking for correction. We will be looking for new direction. As we study God's word devotionally, we're asking those questions. How does this apply to my life? How does this change me from who I am today to who the Lord wants me to be tomorrow? Listen, as we read the Bible devotionally, not looking for facts, not looking for loopholes, not, not looking for the, the broader meaning of the text and, and what it meant to the first century church and all these sorts of things, when we spend time in the Bible devotionally, we're saying, God, speak to me through this text. Transform my life through this verse. And as we read the Bible in this way, God speaks to our hearts and changes our lives in a very personal way. And so we must learn to read the Bible devotionally. Well, regardless of the scope of our study, there are three tools that we must employ if we're going to enjoy the time that we spend in the Bible. And throughout the rest of this four-part study, we're going to learn how to use these three tools. These tools will help us to learn how to get the most out of our Bible study time. The first tool that we're going to look at, it'll be in our study next week, it's the tool of observation. We're going to learn how to observe what's in the text. In the next study after that, we'll consider interpretation. 
We'll consider uh, proper methods of interpreting the text. And, and then in our final study, we'll wrap up the, the entire study uh, by looking at the importance of application. Bible study without application doesn't produce a changed life. We need to study the Bible with the, with the goal of applying it to our lives. And so we'll look at that in the fourth week of this study. But in closing, I just want to share a little testimony with you about the moment I realized that the Bible is actually the word of God. It was a few weeks after I came to Christ, and it, and it hit me. This is the word of God. This is not just some book. This is, as one commentator put it, an integrated message system from a being who sits outside of time and space. And I like that. This is the word of God. And he gave it to us so that we could know him and and know what his will is for our lives. You know, up until that moment of my life, I had done just whatever I wanted to do. You know, I didn't like home life, and so I ran away from home as a teenager. And, and when I left home, you know, my dad always said, you know, when you're under my roof, you do what I say. And I, okay, well, I'll just leave then, because I want to do whatever I want to do. And so I ran away from home, and I lived on the streets, and I did whatever I wanted to do. And, you know, the older I got, the, the, the more, you know, I was just kind of set in that way of I just, you know, I'm my own man. I, you know, make my own decisions, and you can't tell me nothing. And one reason for that is because your opinion isn't any better than my opinion. And, and, and where we disagree, why should I believe in your opinion versus my opinion? You want me to do X, I want to do Y. So why should I listen to you? And that's just how I thought about it. My opinion was the right opinion, and that was, that, that was just that. But then after coming to Christ and realizing that Jesus is God incarnate and and realizing what he had done for me on the cross and, and realizing that the Bible is the word of God, all of a sudden I had a standard that was greater than my opinion. I had a standard that was greater than my opinion and I realized at that moment that I had been living in deception. I was self deceived up until that very day. Because I was living according to whatever I wanted to do, and the Bible tells me to die to myself and deny myself. I had been living in deception the whole time. And I determined that night when I realized that the Bible is the word of God, that I needed to know what it said. Otherwise, I would slip right back into self-deception. I needed to know the truth, which is found in God's word, so that I might not return to self-deception. And I made it my aim that night to know God's word so that I could align my life to it. One of the things that I discovered is in Psalm 119, verse 105, tells us that God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, and it is. And I was so happy to find that out because I'd just been stumbling my way through life, just living according to the dictates of my own conscience. I didn't know if I was right or wrong. All I know is you didn't know if you were right or wrong either, so I might as well just do whatever I want to do. I had no greater standard nothing to cling to. But then I realized that God's word is the standard. And I realized that it would light the path before me and help me to see if I was actually walking the narrow path of Jesus Christ or not. And so I began to learn God's word. I began to study it. 
Everything else in my life was secondary to knowing God and knowing his word. And that's my encouragement to you tonight to, to realize what God's word actually is. It's not a good book, as some call it, the good book from the man upstairs. It's the word of God. It's the instruction manual that he gave us so that we could know what his will is for our lives. It's not a book that we can just kind of treat like a buffet line and, well, I'll take some of that, but now nah, you know, there's dying to myself stuff now, though. That's how too many Christians read it. We, we try to treat it like a buffet line. And yeah, I don't like that stuff, but I like this stuff. I'll take double helping of that. But I love the grace and the forgiveness, but the obedience, nah, not really my thing. Be careful when you do that because you now sit in judgment over God's word when you choose to pick and choose the, the, the things that you want in the Bible and reject what you don't want. God's word is the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. And if you want to walk in the truth, then you need to know God's word. But in order to know God's word, you have to spend time studying it. You have to spend time studying it. And you have to spend time <coughs> prayerfully considering how God's word applies to your life so that you can align your life to the truth found in his word. If you would simply spend time every day studying the word of God and seeking to understand what God is saying to you, then you can be certain that the spiritual path before you will forever be illuminated by the truths that we find here in God's word.